In this video, we're going to talk about references. And we'll start this conversation by explaining a little bit about indirection. Indirection is just the concept of having more than one name or handle for any piece of data in our software. So somewhere in our software, we might have some piece of data, and we can have more than one way from our code of actually interacting with that data. And so each of these handles refers to the same actual underlying piece of data over here. And anything that we do to either of these handles actually happens to this piece of data. So if this piece of data is a number and via handle one, we add five, that add five is actually gonna happen on this piece of data, the number underneath. Likewise, any read operations that we apply to any of these handles will read the same piece of data. So if somewhere in our code we say handle one plus equals five, we'll add five to data. And then if we read the value in handle two, it'll see the result of that add five operation because it's referencing the same piece of data that handle one was when it did that operation to begin with. Indirection is a very useful concept and there are a lot of tools for handling it in any programming language, including C++. And it's useful because we can now have two different sections of our code that talk about and use the same piece of data underneath. This is really useful when it comes to organizing our code because we can share data when it's appropriate. So references are the simplest form of indirection in C++. They are basically exactly what we just laid out in the previous slide. To declare a reference, we'll take a normal variable declaration and add a ampersand to the type. So this is going to tell the compiler that my reference is going to be a variable of type reference to an int. And the type still matters here because my reference can only reference variables of type int. We won't be able to give any other type of data to my reference other than ints. And to create the actual reference relationship, we just use the assignment operator to say that my reference references the variable my data. This happens in the initialization of the reference variable and it always has to happen there. You are not allowed in C++ to have a reference that doesn't actually reference any data. So we always have to give an initializer when we're declaring our references. So for the entire life of this my reference variable, it will always refer to the my data variable. So we might use the same kind of diagram that we were using in the previous slide to talk about reference relationships. And so we have some concrete piece of data, in this case, an integer called my data, and then some reference or handle to that data. We say my reference points to my data. And we have this little arrow connecting the reference or the handle to the actual underlying data. So when we create a reference, again, we have to create that relationship and we're not allowed to change that relationship while my reference exists. Now, as we said, any operations that get applied to the reference will actually have an impact on the underlying data. And the syntax for that in C++ is the same as just using the variable itself. There's no special syntax. So if we say my reference plus equals five here, then that plus equals five operator is going to get applied to my data, the underlying integer. And so my data will now be 15, uh, which we could see either by inspecting my data or by inspecting the my reference handle to it. And the same is true when accessing members of objects. So in this example, we declare a new variable s of type standard string, and we initialize it with the string literal my string data. So that gives us some concrete data here called s. In the next line, we're going to declare a new variable sr which is a reference to a standard string, and we're going to initialize it to point at s. So now we have a handle called sr, and it points to s. So whenever we use sr, in this case we can ask sr for its size by saying sr.size, we will actually be passing that member access down to the underlying data s. And so this will print out 14, which is the number of characters inside of the string literal. 
And all of the same syntax applies no matter where you're using references. So here we have a example function signature uh, for a function called swap. And we're going to take in two variables and we're going to take them as references to integers. And so all the same rules will apply. Uh, in this case, whenever we call the function, we're going to have to provide data for both of these parameters. Well, that's the same for any other variable. But in this case, when we provide that data, a reference relationship is going to be formed for each of these variables. So A will point to something and B will point to something. And then inside of swap, wherever we interact with A and B, those operations will actually get forwarded on to the underlying data behind each of those references. Now there's one gotcha that we've got to discuss when it comes to references, and that's the idea of a dangling reference. I explained already how we have to initialize references when we declare them. The compiler will actually fail to compile any program that declares a reference without initializing it to pointing to some valid object. But there are ways to have the object that is getting pointed to actually get destroyed before the reference gets destroyed. And so you could have a reference that used to point to a valid object and it still points to where it thought that object was, but that object is no longer in a valid state. To demonstrate this, I've pulled some example code from cppreference.com. The beginning of this example declares a new function called f, takes in no parameters, but it returns a string reference. And inside of this function, we declare a new variable s of type string initialize it with the text example, and then we return that string s. We're returning a reference, so we're just returning a handle to some underlying piece of data. And we know that because s is declared in the scope of this function, as soon as this function ends, s is going to get destroyed, and whatever resources it's using to store the text example are going to get cleaned up. It'll no longer be a valid string. Well, that becomes problematic on these next lines of code. So here we call the function f and we store the result in a new variable r, which is again of type reference to a stud string. And this actually creates a dangling reference. It will compile because at the time r is initialized, the string still exists. But immediately after that initialization is done, the scope of f is going to get cleaned up and s will get destroyed. So on the next line, when we try to read R by passing it into the standard C out stream, we are going to get undefined behavior. And it's important to note that this even happens if we just try to copy the variable. So here we are declaring a new variable S just of type standard string, and we're initializing it with the return value of another call to that function F. So normally if F just returned a, a string variable, this would copy that string that F returned into S. But because we're copying it from a dangling reference, we are again going to trigger undefined behavior because it's the same as trying to read from that reference. We're going to have to read from it in order to actually copy the data over. So both of these examples actually trigger undefined behavior, uh, which is obviously really bad for our program. But a general rule for how we can avoid these kinds of things is to make sure that we are not returning references to temporary variables or we're not pulling references from temporary objects. So if you ever see a function where the return type is a reference, but we're returning a named temporary or any kind of temporary variable from within that function, you know that that's immediately going to create a dangling reference. This isn't to say that every function that returns a reference will cause this problem. You can have member functions which return references to members that are internal to an object. That's totally fine as long as the object itself outlives the, the reference that you return. So one example where returning a reference is totally fine is the at function of std array. So we can declare an array of three integers called a here, initialize them with the data 0, 1, 2. And if we ask a to give us the element at position 0, it will actually return that as a reference, in this case a reference to an int. This is totally fine because a still exists, so the data inside of a that represents that 0th element is still there. We can modify IR, we can read it, write it, do whatever we want, we'll still be uh, affecting that zeroth element. And it will only be after A gets destroyed that this would become a dangling reference. So as long as we clean up IR before we destroy A, there's no problems here with returning a reference. And that's it for references.
like I said there, the simplest form of indirection that we have in C++, they basically behave exactly the way we would expect uh, an indirect object to work. They give us handles that point to underlying data, and for references, that relationship stays constant. So when we create a reference, it will always point to that data. In the next video, we're going to talk about pointers, which are another tool that give us a little bit more flexibility than references, but handle the same cases of indirection.